As the ashes of World War II settled, the Soviet Union sought to cement itself as a naval superpower. In 1948, it unveiled its maritime tour de force, the Sverdlov-class cruisers. These cutting-edge warships emerged on the horizon, bristling with an arsenal to command the seas. 1,252mm B-38 guns thundered in unison. 32 37mm anti-aircraft guns swiveled to track the sky, and 10 torpedo tubes lay in wait beneath the waves. Their big net air search radars, eyes piercing through fog and storm, coupled with a sleek hull cutting through the water at a swift 33 knots, sent a clear message of challenge across the waters to NATO. In this display of might, they stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with, if not shadowing, the greatest cruisers from the West. The last of its kind, Murmansk carried the legacy of the Northern Fleet's dominance, casting a long shadow across the Norwegian Sea. For years, the Sverdlov-class cruisers patrolled the waters unchallenged, masters of their domain. As the Soviet Union's echo dwindled into history, Murmansk faced an unparalleled challenge. Fierce and unforgiving, a relentless storm hurled it into the cold clutches of a Norwegian fjord where she was left, grounded and forsaken. That was, however, until hints of a mysterious secret substance concealed within her hull began to leak out, one linked to the infamously deadly Russian Federal Security Service. Like the Soviet light cruiser Murmansk, even the most powerful warships meet their fate sunk by the threads of destiny. But what if you wanted to intentionally sink your own destroyer? That's the thrilling premise of Operation Trident Fury, a standout documentary on Magellan TV. This action-packed film captures a high-stakes military exercise where fighter jets, warships, and a submarine compete against each other to sink HMCS Huron in a high-octane race across the ocean. It's a spectacle of naval might that will captivate any fan of our Dark Seas series, and that is just one of many. Magellan TV stands apart with its extensive collection of high-quality documentaries. From gripping historical accounts to explorations of ancient ruins and wild animal behaviors, there's something for every type of documentary lover, and new content is released every week. Here's a deal you shouldn't miss. Click the link in the description below to start a 30-day free trial. Dive deep into over 3,000 titles, including must-sees like Sinking a Destroyer. Whether you're watching on your TV, computer, or mobile device, Magellan TV offers a world of knowledge and entertainment at your fingertips. Use the promo code DARKSEAS to unlock this exclusive offer. Don't just watch TV. Experience the adventure and learn something new with Magellan TV. In the wake of World War II, the British, riding high on their victory against the German U-boat peril in the Atlantic, were brimming with confidence about the Royal Navy's prowess. They believed their mighty fleet could effectively counter any submarine threat. This era, predating the advent of nuclear submarines, saw the Royal Navy's self-assured stance in safeguarding their maritime trade routes. However, as a major global trading power, the British remained acutely susceptible to assaults by enemy surface raiders. History had already underscored this vulnerability with the notorious exploits of the German cruiser Admiral Graf Spee, immortalized by the Battle of the River Plate. These surface raiders, characterized by their speed, lethality, and operational independence, had the capacity to wreak havoc on shipping and then vanish before any counterstrike. Thus, when the British and their NATO allies got wind of the Soviet Union's latest maritime juggernaut, the intimidating Sverdlov-class cruisers, alarm bells started ringing. Here was the nightmare scenario for the British, a swift, maneuverable cruiser bristling with armament and perfectly engineered to be the ultimate surface raider. While Britain and NATO harbored grave concerns about these Soviet behemoths turning into marauding shipping raiders and disrupting Allied trade in a potential conflict, the Soviets had even grander schemes for their fearsome new cruisers. The Sverdlov class was the second class of cruisers built by the Soviet Union after World War II. They were the successors of the Chapayev class. Sverdlovs were pivotal in the USSR's ambitious vision to reshape the post-war world. Alongside the cruisers, the Soviet military blueprint included the construction of cutting-edge battleships and aircraft carriers. These plans were not limited to building a fleet. They were about forging a globetrotting Soviet naval force, a power capable of projecting Soviet might to any corner of the planet. The Sverdlov class, with their impressive range of 9,000 nautical miles, epitomized this grand strategy. This range, not unlike the German cruiser Graf Spee's 8,900 nautical miles, enabled them to patrol vast oceanic expanses. The British, in drawing parallels between these Soviet cruisers and the German pocket battleships of early World War II, had ample reason for trepidation. The havoc wreaked by just two of these German ships in a matter of months justified the British's concerns about the Sverdlovs. 
During the 1950s, the British showdown with the Soviet Union was predominantly a chess game of political and ideological maneuvering, sparing them an immediate test against the combat prowess of the Sverdlov-class cruisers. Yet, the urgency to devise a countermeasure was palpable. The Royal Navy recognized that the true existential threat to the West would materialize only if the Soviets succeeded in assembling a carrier fleet to back their cruisers' long-range operations. This scenario bought the West crucial time to strategize their response. Instead of responding in kind with a new class of ships, the Royal Navy took a different road. They opted to develop a specialized strike aircraft capable of deploying conventional and nuclear armament. The Admiralty's assessment was clear-cut. A warplane, launched from the Navy's fleet carriers and striking swiftly at low altitude, could neutralize the Sverdlov menace. Thus, the genesis of the Blackburn Buccaneer began. However, the threat of Soviet shipping raids loomed large. As Britain fast-tracked the Buccaneer's development, the Soviet Union was rapidly churning out Sverdlov-class cruisers. Between 1952 and 55, an astonishing total of 14 cruisers were laid down. The Soviets were betting big on the Sverdlov class, a fleet they believed held the winning cards in this high-stakes naval game. On September 22, 1955, a significant milestone was reached in Soviet naval history with the completion of the latest and last iteration of the mighty Sverdlov class cruisers. At the Severodvinsk dry docks, this naval titan was christened Murmansk. Despite the Soviet Union's grandiose vision of an unparalleled fleet with global reach, Murmansk ironically marked the end of the Sverdlov line. Its journey, steeped in ambition, yet culminating in an abrupt finale, would eerily mirror the eventual fate of the Soviet Union itself. Murmansk, like the rest of her sisters, was an impressive showcase of Soviet naval power in the post-World War II era. It was designed as an improved and slightly larger version of the pre-war Chapayev-class cruiser, featuring advancements in hull design, armor protection, and weaponry. It was adapted to operate effectively in the rough waters of the North Atlantic and the Black Seas. Size-wise, Murmansk was substantial, with a standard displacement of 13,600 tons and a full load displacement of 16,640 tons. They were about 210 meters long and had a beam of 22 meters, making them larger than most post-World War II gun cruiser designs of peer nations. Its size was complemented by a robust armament suite, which included 12 152mm 57 caliber B-38 guns in four triple turrets and 12 100mm 56 caliber model 1934 guns in six twin mounts. This primary armament was powerful and versatile, capable of devastating merchant vessels and effective against shore targets. The 152mm guns were similar to those used by cruisers like Ajax and Achilles at the Battle of the River Plate, indicating their effectiveness as a light cruiser weapon. For anti-aircraft defense, the Murmansk cruiser was equipped with 32 37mm anti-aircraft guns and 16 twin mounts and 10 5.33mm torpedo tubes, ensuring a strong defense against air and submarine threats. Murmansk was equipped with a sophisticated suite of radar and electronic countermeasures, reflecting the advanced technological capabilities of the Soviet Navy at the time. The radar suite was a complex network designed for comprehensive surveillance and precision in warfare. The big net, or top trough radar, served as a long-range air search system, functioning like an advanced lookout, capable of detecting aircraft far beyond visual range. Complementing this was the high sieve or low sieve radar, which added depth to the cruiser's aerial surveillance capabilities by covering different altitude bands. For more specific or tactical air searches, the knife rest radar added another layer of detection, ensuring no gaps were left in the ship's protective radar coverage. Navigation was critically managed by the Don-2 or Neptune radar, akin to a high-tech maritime GPS, guiding the cruiser safely through complex waters. The fire control aspect was handled by the Sun Visor radar, directing the ship's anti-aircraft guns with precision, like a marksman scope for the ship's arsenal. The top bow radars, dedicated to the 152mm main guns, and the egg cup gun radars for smaller caliber weapons enhanced the accuracy and targeting capability of the cruiser's daunting armament. Finally, the Watchdog Electronic Countermeasure, or ECM, systems served as a defensive tool designed to jam or deceive enemy radars and electronic sensors. These systems were the ship's electronic shield, blinding or confusing enemy tracking systems to protect the cruiser from detection or targeting. The heavy anti-aircraft armament and the comprehensive suite of radar equipment made Murmansk impressive in solo raiding missions and even more threatening in task groups. Murmansk along with her Sverdlov-class counterparts, was born into an era of profound transformation in naval warfare. 
This period marked a shift from traditional gunnery to the dawn of missile technology. Consequently, while these cruisers emerged as powerful, swift, and menacing adversaries to the West, their inception was tinged with a sense of impending obsolescence. The trajectory of Murmansk, much like the Soviet Union itself, was a paradoxical blend of initial grandeur and subsequent decline. Launched amidst a fanfare of triumph, she symbolized a bold future for Soviet maritime dominance. Yet the harsh realities soon facing the Soviet Union ensnared Murmansk in an inevitable spiral of decay. Commissioned on September 22, 1955, Murmansk was assigned to the 2nd Cruiser Division upon its formation in 1956. Her service record, however, remained largely uneventful, confined to routine patrols in the White Sea, the Norwegian Sea, and the North Sea. In an era defined by its Cold War chill and lack of direct military engagements, Vermont's role evolved into that of a deterrent against Western forces. Her potential as a formidable shipping raider remained unrealized. Further hamstringing her operational capacity was the deteriorating Soviet economy and military industry, which thwarted ambitions of building a robust carrier fleet. Deprived of carrier support, Ramansk and her sister ships were effectively tethered, their operations restricted to coastal waters. This limitation drastically reduced their threat potential to NATO nations. After years marked by neglect and hastened obsolescence, Ramansk's journey ended not in a blaze of glory, but in a final ignominious transaction. In 1994, she was sold for scrap to India, in what was to be the closing chapter of a ship that once embodied the Soviet Union's naval aspirations. On December 24th, while being towed to her final destination, a ferocious storm enveloped the vessel. Amidst the tempest's fury, the once feared Soviet cruiser broke free, drifting wildly and eventually running aground. She came to rest near Surveyor, a small village perched on an island along Norway's rugged northern coast, an area notorious for its tumultuous seas and harsh weather conditions. Initial speculation suggested that the relentless winter storms would naturally dismantle Murmansk, eroding the portions protruding above the waterline. However, in 2009, a decision was made, backed by financial commitment, to methodically disassemble the ship. Given the cruiser's dilapidated state, towing was out of the question. The only viable solution was a meticulous, piece-by-piece -piece deconstruction. Scandinavia's premier demolition expert, AFDCOM, was tasked with this challenge. They constructed an immense seawall and dry dock encircling Murmansk. This enabled the shipwreck to be approached from land, facilitating its disassembly right where it had foundered. By April 2012, the mooring surrounding the wreck had been effectively sealed off, and by mid-May, the dry dock was almost entirely devoid of water. As the colossal endeavor commenced two decades after its grounding, the sudden surge in activity to address its remains sparked a flurry of rumors and concerns. Whispers about potential radioactive materials aboard the vessel began to circulate, fueling apprehensions about the true impetus behind the urgent dismantling operation in the Norwegian fjord. Reports surfaced, some suggesting that the discovery of radioactive residue, posing a significant threat to the local population, was the catalyst for this extensive undertaking. Among these rumors, there were claims from individuals linked to the operation that polonium-210, a highly radioactive substance with a half-life of 138 days, had been found in the cruiser. Traces of the substance had been found at the sites of some of the Russian Federal Security Service's most blatant attacks on Russian defectors and dissidents around the world. However, amidst this swirl of speculation and debate, concrete information remained elusive. Authorities did not confirm the nature of the materials aboard Murmansk, or the potential risks they might pose to the surrounding area. In 2013, the operation to dismantle the once dreaded Soviet cruiser reached its conclusion. Murmansk, a warship that once loomed as a threat in the imaginations of Western military strategists, faded into history, leaving behind a legacy wrapped in both Cold War intrigue and the enigmatic circumstances of its final dismantling. Ready to embark on a journey through history and beyond? Click now to unlock your 30-day free trial with Magellan TV using the promo code Dark Seas. Discover a world where gripping documentaries and untold stories stream endlessly. Just a click away.